Okay. Hello, everyone. So welcome to today's presentation. I'm going to be presenting on the Department of Electronics, kind of give you a little, a little idea of what we do here in the department, some of the uh, different programs we offer and stuff like that. My name is Michael Feuerherm. I'll be presenting for today. So on the Department of Electronics side of things, we have a department website here. I just have the link available. So it's just doe.carlton.ca. You can go there to find more information on the department, different things we offer, stuff about the programs. Um, I won't be able to go into all the detail I'd like to today, obviously, just from a time limit perspective. That's okay, more information's available, and I'll be available at my booth after the presentation if you have further questions. So getting into it, the general outline for what I'm going to be covering today is seen here. So first, we're just going to kind of talk about a background on electrical engineering and related disciplines. We'll look at a description of the programs offered by the Department of Electronics here, and we'll talk about the unique strengths of Carleton. And lastly, we're going to look at kind of an example of electrical engineering solutions and what the different programs in our department can move towards as far as the solutions go. So to start off, just looking at some famous electrical engineers you may or may not be familiar with. So here we have Thomas Edison, which you've probably heard the name if nothing else, but he had nearly 1,100 uh, inventions to his name. We have Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. Nikola Tesla, you're probably familiar with as well. And then we have Dr. Charles Cow, who is a um, very large contributor to photonics and fiber optics. And you may be familiar with Rowan Atkinson. Most people probably know him as Mr. Bean instead of Rowan Atkinson, the electrical engineer, but he does have an electrical engineering degree. Now, in electrical engineering, it's a pretty broad discipline. What do we actually do? Well, let's look at a couple of examples of what electrical engineers do, some of these different applications. The first one, space electronics is a ever-growing field right now. So a very good classic example of this is Voyager 1. So it's currently 21 billion kilometers from Earth in interstellar space. It's actually still commuting, communicating with Earth through the deep space network, which is just a network of um, antennas around the globe. So we're still able to communicate with this piece of technology that is 21 billion kilometers away from us through the use of electrical engineering. On the closer to home side of things, we have the Electrical Energy Distribution Network. So we can actually see from this composite image from NASA, from space, the ability to actually view human applications of electrical engineering. All of this effectively light pollution is what it is, but you can see these lights from space. Well, how do we actually do that? This is done through the grid, which you've again probably heard of, but may not be familiar with. So this is the electrical distribution grid, which is one of the largest examples of man-made infrastructure. Now it can be a little bit difficult to see on this uh, diagram here. However, you can see some of the lines. Let me just turn on my laser pointer here. So you can see very various parts of this grid that go down the Eastern seaboard on the Western seaboard as well. And Essentially, this is just a very large man-made piece of infrastructure that applies electrical engineering to people's everyday lives. Now, we have this energy that we're distributing. How do we create it? We have power generation through different method methods, so hydro, wind, solar, stuff like that. Here we have an example of a dam where the water will flow through the dam, turning some turbines, and generate our AC power. And this actually brings together multiple different disciplines, the civil to build the actual dam itself, mechanical for the turbines, electrical for the electricity generation, and a multitude of other things as well. On the more personal side of things, we also have consumer items. So we have things like smart appliances, stuff that you might be familiar with, a smart fridge is starting to be more common. We also have things like vehicles. So the electric vehicle general um, Sales and everything is increasing as time goes by. It's a bigger and bigger part of the market. And just in general, even in regular internal combustion engine cars, you're having more and more chips or more and more smart features included in them. So electrical engineering is applied in basically every facet of that as well. Continuing on, now if you're tuning into this, you're probably familiar with at least one of these devices. We have personal computers, tablets, smartphones, all of the above have electrical engineering components, obviously, and are generally focused around electrical engineering, whether it's the chips within them, the cameras, different things like that. 
On the more technical side of things, engineer or electrical engineers typically work with integrated circuits. So these are the small chips that you see um, typically. So a couple examples here, we have an integrated or a processor that was introduced in 1982 that had 134,000 transistors on it. Now, what is a transistor? It's this little diagram shown right here. So we're not gonna get into the specifics of how they function. However, that's what we use to build the logic uh, behind all of our processors and things like that. So in 1982, we had about 134,000. Now we're looking at 2013, we had, what is this, approximately 5 billion as the count for our transistors. So you can start to see this exponential growth. So these are typically things that as an electrical engineer, you would be, you would see throughout your degree as well, but not necessarily focused depending on what discipline you pick as well. One of the areas of electrical engineering as well here, that's more on the physics end of things is photonics. So optical components. You might be familiar with things like this through TV remotes or Blu-ray. However, as fiber becomes more, um, more adopted throughout the world as well, you can start to see the applications there where we have much faster internet connections and things like that based off of this. Now, let's speak broadly for a second. We've looked at some applications. What does electrical engineer actually do on the grander scale? So the idea here is it's the analysis and design of systems, circuits, and devices used to transmit, store, and process information and energy. So electrical engineering can st string anywhere along from on the hardware side, so designing actual circuits and testing them and things like that, all the way, the way over to software, where we actually have to interact with the devices and use those values to do something, digital signal processing and applications. So now we're gonna look a little bit at the Carleton side of electrical engineering more specifically. So we offer three different programs within the Department of Electronics. These are engineering physics, electrical engineering, and sustainable and renewable energy engineering. Now, each of these three programs has a different focus for the most part, but there is a good amount of overlap as well. So engineering physics typically focuses more on the hardware side of things, the physics background, kind of the nitty gritty on the science side more so. Electrical engineering covers some of the same. You're looking at some of the physics as well. You're also starting to look at a couple software courses and things like that. And we'll talk about each program specifically in a minute. And then we have sustainable and renewable energy engineering, which will cover a broad range of topics as well. And once again, we'll talk about specifics for each of these. So the first one we'll look at here is the Bachelor of Engineering and Electrical Engineering specifically. So this is a field that provides graduates with a great deal of flexibility. As I said, it's kind of a broader approach. So our program generally reflects the technology-driven industry in the Ottawa area. So with a wide range of elective courses in integrated circuit design and fabrication, telecommunication systems, and computer hardware and software. Now, this is a typical tree uh, for the most recent year of electrical engineering. So this is the program tree. So let's take a look at kind of how these are broken down, what they look like and what they mean. So there are different uh, categories for each of these courses. We have these blackboarded courses, which are called engineering core courses. So every engineering stream will take these at some point throughout their degree typically. We have green boarded courses, which are math focused yellow, which are science focused, so the hard sciences like chemistry and physics. Then we have the orange bordered courses, which are electrical courses specifically. So these are looking at the actual electronic side, things like power engineering, digital electronics, stuff like that. We have the purple bordered courses, which are systems courses. So these start to be some more of the software and kind of communication theory side of things. And then we have these electives here as well, which are the gray borders. So in electrical engineering, we actually have five fourth year electives here where you kind of get to choose what you want to specialize in a bit more. You are restricted on exactly what you can take. However, you're given kind of a range of, let's say 15 courses or something to pick stuff from. So if you prefer the software side of things, you can go more software. If you prefer hardware or telecommunications, you can go more that route as well. Now, one thing that's very interesting about our courses typically is we offer a fourth year project, which is this ELEC 4907 large block seen here in the top right. Now, these fourth year projects are full year long courses where you and a group of other engineering students are supervised by a faculty member and you design and build typically something. 
So there are different projects depending on what your application you're looking for and who your supervisor is. However, these could be things like designing the front end of a radio chip or other sustainable sides of things as well. For example, one of the ones I reviewed last year was a sustainable grid um, control system. Moving on to the Bachelors of Engineering in Engineering Physics. So this is the second of three we'll be talking about. This is focused, uh, or the education of this program is focused more on the rapidly changing technological wor world. So it focuses on the physics of optics, photonics, and integrated circuits. So again, it's more of the physics side of things. You'll cover some of the same content as electrical engineering, but you're looking more on the hard sciences end of things. And this is typically more oriented towards training for research and development as well. Looking at the course tree for this, we have some similarities to what we saw before. However, there's some key differences here. So we have the same engineering core courses shown. We have some electrical engineering courses, some of the systems courses, math. We have this red bordered course, which we didn't have before, which is thermodynamics and heat transfer. So it's more of a mechanics course, but it's the science behind that as well. And then you'll notice a very large increase in these yellow bordered science courses. So as I said, these are the hard sciences like physics and chemistry, and engineering and physics will focus heavily on that physics side of things. Okay, and the third and last one we'll talk about here is the Bachelor of Engineering in Sustainable Renewable Energy Engineering. So this is a broad education which is suitable for work in renewable energy, so things like solar, wind, hydro, etc. And this spans things from materials to systems, mechanical to electrical engineering, and engineering all the way to policy. Looking at the tree for three is the short form of this. So again, we have kind of the same general framework for the degree. We'll have a couple of the systems courses, electrical courses, and things like that. However, you'll notice a couple key differences. So once again, we have the same thermodynamics course, but we've introduced this fluids course as well, which is another red border course here, some environmental courses in this blue bordered one, and then these sustainable, sustainability and renewable energy courses is this kind of teal or cyan color there. Now, we'll also take some specialized electronics courses. So in fourth year over here, you can set, see this ELEC 4703, which is solar cells and applications. So you start to delve into the specific electronics of these types of things. And once again, we have this fourth year project in the final year. Okay, before I continue, are there any questions, anything I can clarify for anyone or anything like that? If not, no worries. If you do have any questions throughout, feel free to just post them in the chat there. Uh, we have a host who's monitoring those and kind of let me know if I'm missing something along the way. So feel free. Okay, so continuing on our adventure here. We've looked at the programs that we offer in the department specifically, but why Carleton in general? So Ottawa is a center for engineering and design in wireless and optical communications and related technologies to these fields. The Faculty of Engineering and Department of Electronics specifically has long-standing links to local industry and government labs. So we have undergraduate and graduate students who have worked at NRC, companies like Siena or Skyworks as well in Canada North. So we have some of those connections. Professors have the ability to kind of um, discuss co-ops or potential research applications and stuff like that throughout your degree as well. And the programs offer industry standard facilities and unique training opportunities in several areas. I'm going to talk about the specifics of a little bit of this in a couple of slides. So on the departmental side of things, we cover many different sub-disciplines is what I'll call them. So each of these rep bubbles represents a different sub-discipline typically. So things like wire wireless communications for electrical engineering students, we have things like green technology, which would be under the sustainability and renewable energy or SRE. And then we have things like light wave devices or fiber optics that would fall under the eng phys side of things a bit as well. One thing that I mention here is this co-op option. I tell this to my first year students every year as well. If you have the opportunity, I highly recommend to do co-op throughout. It's just a very good opportunity to get work experience. It gets you kind of applying your knowledge throughout your degree as opposed to getting to the end and then having kind of that very vast change all of a sudden. It kind of lets you get started in the field early on, makes good connections and things like that. So, 
I said I would talk about some of these specific opportunities we offer in our department. One of the large opportunities or abilities to apply things is the micro slash nano fabrication facility we have within our department. So this is on in the Minto building, fourth floor. It's a class 100 clean room and it fabricates electronic integrated circuits and photonic devices. Now the website I've had it here, the little URL, describes it in much more detail than I'll go into here. But to give you an idea of what we're looking at, this room has approximately a 300 meter squared area and it has a low level of environmental pollutants such as dust, airborne microbes, aerosol particles, and chemical vapors. Now, just to give you an idea of the difference here, the ambient air outside in a typical urban environment contains about a million particles per cubic foot, that is 0.5 micrometers or larger in diameter. The class 100 here refers to the particles of size 0.5 micrometers or larger permitted per cubic foot excuse me, per cubic foot of air. So we have a hundred versus a million. So you can see kind of the difference here and why it's so specialized to, to have this room. And the idea here is we wanna have less particles in the air and less chance of damaging the circuits as you're making them. One of the things our department looks at as well is the idea of radio frequency integrated circuits or RFICs for short. So. On the left side here, we can see kind of a circuit representation. So each of these is kind of a building block of one of these RFICs. So we have an LNA, which is a low noise amplifier. We have some mixers. Other stuff would include different devices or different components and stuff like that as well. And then we actually can lay it out. So this is what the RFIC would physically look like if you had a microscope to look at it. And this is the type of thing you're able to fabricate in our fabrication facility. Another thing that we offer is an anechoic chamber at Carleton in the Department uh, of Electronics specifically as well. If you follow this link I put here, there's small tours you can do of these facilities. So it's a panoramic view of the facility itself. So just take a look around if you like there. So if you're not familiar with an anechoic chamber, absolutely no worries. So an anechoic chamber is an isolated room used to measure the radiated power of various antennas. Here you can see a horn antenna to measure the radiation pattern as well. So just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, if you're more curious, you can see some tours here as well, or feel free to ask questions. Another thing that students are able to do here is the undergraduate project side of things. So this is a course offered specifically to electrical engineering uh, is the one I'll be talking about here. However, there's typically equivalents in other streams as well. So the first project we're going to look here is completely built by students, designed by students, everything. So it's called the Small Handhold, Handheld Integrated Mobility Pro Exploration, or SHRIMPY for short. It is a small exploration robot that hopes to address surveillance and exploration of areas humans cannot reach. So it's relatively compact and more rugged. It's controlled via sensor inputs in a glove and built using a Raspberry Pi and various sensors and motors. So the idea here was depending, you'd wear this glove that would sense your fingers and depending how many fingers you were holding up and which fingers you were holding up, it would turn, stop, slow down, reverse, or take that input however you designed it. The second project we'll look at here was Project Insight. So again, another third year project by students. So typically groups of approximately four students are making these. This was controlled remotely using a PlayStation controller. It accomplished path tracking. So if you set out a path along with tape, it would center itself on that and follow along the path. It would use collision detection and avoidance. So if it found it was approaching some sort of obstacle, it would slow down and stop. If something was approaching it, it might be able to reverse or adjust course. And lastly, it also had a sun tracking solar panel. So you can see that in the bottom picture here. Now we had, or they had, sorry, uh, light dependent resistors on each of these sides of this, what looks like a plus here basically. And using that, the, there was a motor controlling this um, solar panel, and it could follow the sun based on where the light was hitting this sensor. Okay, let's actually pause here for a second. As I'm moseying through, are there any questions so far? Okay, here we are. Okay, so someone in the Q&A asked, do you think engineering physics is a good step to a future in biophysics? It could be potentially. It's kind of a broad question is the thing. So depends what you're looking at for biophysics, what type of applications you're looking for. Are you looking more on the physics side, on the bio side specifically is my assumption based on your question. However, what type 
of biophysics would you like to do? Is, is my general question to you. Um, if you want to sit down and have a discussion, as I mentioned, my booth will be open right after here as well. Um, however, if you want to follow up that question as well, feel free. Um, it very well could be if you want to focus on the, let's say, the electrical side of biophysics, um, but could be an option. There's also, I believe it's Biomed Elec. I'm not too familiar with that um, engineering program specifically at Carleton, but it is one that Carleton offers as well. Okay, if you do have a follow-up to that, just let me know. Um, I'll check back in the, in the chat in a couple minutes. Okay, so continuing on, what kind of approach are we going to take in the Department of Electronics or what can you foresee? So the typical approach of electrical design has three major steps in it. So to start off, there's the system level design. So as I said, each one of these objects here is a component in a circuit that is actually a bunch of a little electronic components that build into these blocks. So we started a system level design. We say, this is what this entire system needs to be able to accomplish. And here's the software we're going to use to interact. We move on to the circuit level design. So each of these little things here is a transistor. We have resistors here. And each of these are, or sorry, each of these transistors we can use to build into one of these blocks and put them together. Once we have a circuit level design, is what that's typically referred to as, we move on to the device level design. So we have a bunch of funny looking rectangles down here. This is what a transistor actually looks out looks like when it's laid out on a, or a, um, a circuit board. So the idea here would be you're actually building each of these components out into a physical equivalent, and then you can build and test it. Now, how does this look on the kind of upper level? we have two comparable pieces. So we said we would design the schematic level here, so the circuit level design, and we said we would lay it out and have a physical equivalent. Now the problem becomes, typically when we're designing the circuit and doing layout, there's some assumptions we make along the way, either in, explicitly as designers or in the software itself, some assumptions we make. So typically what you'll do is you'll design it at the circuit level, test it, make sure it meets whatever specifications you're looking for, You'll do the same once you've laid it out, and then you compare them to see what non-idealities might be in the layout that weren't accounted for originally, or things like that, just to kind of make sure that your design process is consistent and no errors have been made along the way. Now, the idea here, just to give you kind of a physical sense of what we're looking at here, typically we'll be designing these circuits in one of our many labs. So this is one of the labs we have at Carleton uh, in the department specifically. This is the VLSI lab. We can fabricate these using our microfab facility that we discussed earlier, and then we can actually test this using hardware that we have on campus. We can test each of the chips that you make as well. Okay, I will pause it here for a second and just check chat for any more questions. Okay, perfect. Okay, so continuing on, we have technology revolutions. So we've kind of talked about electrical engineering in general. We've talked about the different programs we offer, what my, what my department does, things like that. Now let's look kind of in a broader sense of electrical engineering applications. So electrical engineers have been at the heart of several revolutions in, in technology, typically over the past century specifically. So these paradigm shifts have radically changed the way society functions. Think of how many smart devices you've now interacted with over your life. So two major examples of this would be the internet, just the connection and communication across everywhere, essentially, and potentially a new energy paradigm shift that we're seeing approach now. So let's start. Let's look at the internet kind of as a past case study for a second. We have in the pre-1980s, we had centralized mainframes for storing information and things like that. Now we have the introduction of the internet and we can adopt distributed computing. So instead of having central mainframes that people use, you have an individual personalized computer or PC. So everyone now owns a PC or a smartphone or a tablet or something along those lines typically. And you can use these to share resources, computing, share photos, whatever you like. And it's just a very widely adopted technology at this point. This allowed for innovation and industry transformation through the creation of companies like Google and eBay. I know YouTube is technically a subset of Google at this point. However, this just basically allowed companies and business to expand into this new space as well. 
Okay, so this is kind of a past case study. Let's look at what's going on currently. So currently, we typically have mostly centralized generation through things like nuclear power plants, coal plants, whichever. What if we move to a more localized approach? So instead of having central generation, we had localized power generation. So things like solar panels on individual houses, wind turbines closer to the point of use. So you generate it close to the area you use it in. So you could widely adopt this. So everyone kind of has their own power generation for the most part. You wouldn't have to transport this energy. So the large infrastructure we have that transport energy already could probably be reduced in some aspects. And again, this allows businesses and innovation on the technology side. So this would require new technologies for distributed renewable energy. So better solar cells, turbines, storage is a big one as well. And new energy companies based on this inf information technology and power electronics technologies as well. So basically it's a beneficial thing to approach for business because of these new opportunities in space as well. Okay. So we've talked about renewable energy in general is probably what we're going to try and go to. We'll look at these sources. So for any new energy source we're looking at, we probably want to consider a few things. So first, is it renewable? So can we continue to use it throughout? What is the pollution associated with its use? And how can we store and distribute this energy source? So do we have to generate all of the energy somewhere, distribute it through transmission lines? Can we generate it locally? Things like that. Now, Looking kind of back a little bit, we have industrial society, which was built on fossil fuel consumption as a primary energy source. So fossil fuels are easy to store and transport typically, basically either through some sort of solid or liquid or gas even. Um, they have a high energy density. So in joules per kilogram is typically what it's measured in. But there's a couple drawbacks here. So oil and gas reserves are being depleted. That's, a, that's an occurring thing that's going on. But also potentially more importantly at this point, the environmental impact of transportation and use of these fossil fuels has become a major concern globally. So cheap energy built modern civilization. How can we make civilization adopt better alternatives going forward? Well, typically we do that by offering the cheapest solution. So coal is fairly abundant throughout the world and it's we have enough that could last us centuries. So that supply issue that we talked about not so much with coal. Unfortunately, it has severe environmental impacts through the things like smog and air pollution in general. So as a society, we want to use electrical engineering extensively just to provide us power for our everyday use, electronics, whichever. And we aim to generate electricity without using fossil fuels. That'll be our overarching goal right now. This requires a couple of things. So alternative methods for energy generation, which we've kind of mentioned here. Improved electrical energy storage is a major research area as well, and more efficient use of this energy. So that's something that could happen either on a personal level of when you choose to use energy, how you choose to use it, or on a broader level of just more efficient electronics. So when we're looking at these new sources, the idea is we want this new source to be cleaner than whatever we're replacing. So looking at Ontario as kind of a case study here, this is most recent from 2018. And you can see the kind of breakdown of the different sources of energy we have. So 60% of our energy is generated through nuclear, 26 through hydro, 7% through wind, three from natural gas. And then we start to get into the smaller kind of piece of the pie here. So we can see that we have fairly renewable energy for the most part, whether or not you consider nuclear renewable, I suppose is the, the big differential there. However, it's relatively clean energy in Ontario, but we can always do better and choosing to kind of improve throughout is never a bad thing. So let's take a look. We want to improve this. One of the ways we can do that is through solar cells or solar energy. This is typically done through photovoltaics. So we'll talk briefly about what those are, and then we can kind of look at the applications. So photovoltaics is the idea that light interacts with electrons in silicon. It breaks these chemical bonds, and effectively we can harness this to create energy. So the idea here, is the photons or light with energy greater than the band gap excite band electrons from valence band to conduction bands. So if the energy of our photon is larger than this gap between the valence band and conduction band, we essentially free this electron. But how do we actually extract energy from this? Great, we, we have an electron, what do we do with it? Okay, 
So if we want to be able to do something with that, we have to improve our material. We have to make it very efficient at freeing these electrons. So if we add phosphorus, it makes the silicon electron rich. If we add boron, it makes the silicon electron poor, or what we call hole rich, which is any kind of imaginary uh, positive charge instead of an electron. Now, we can engineer this material, now that we kind of have these base building blocks, to improve how well our photovoltaics work. And what we end up doing is the creation of a silicon junction. So we have a way to capture the free electron if it comes close to the junction. The electric field will sweep it into the phosphorus doped material. And what we essentially end up is, end up with, sorry, is a battery. So we end up with a positively charged area and a negatively charged area. And this will look similar to, this is, I believe, it's just a AA battery. However, the same idea applies, where we can use this to power something now. For silicon, at best, only about 25% of incident sunlight can be converted to electric power. In practice, things like losses in wiring resistance makes the practical energy conversion efficiency close to about 15%. And again, this is being ever improved. Overall, we each consume about one kilowatt of power over the day. And that doesn't typically include heating or transportation. So we can only extract about 150 watts per square meter in bright sunshine. We'll need about seven meters squared for our one kilowatt daily usage. Now the problem, we also have to store this energy in batteries for use at night or on cloudy days. The sun isn't always shining where we are, so we have to account for that. So instead, we make that about 35 meters squared for a person for a day. Still, that's only about six meters per side, so a six meters squared. The roof of a house is typically bigger than that. However, each individual person consumes that much, so you need to account for multiple people per household, potentially. Now, what about cost? I kind of mentioned this earlier, but the way to get people to adopt things is typically make the cheapest option. So to do that, let's look at the costs of various different types of energy generation. So at the top here, we have gas, different types of natural gas um, generation. We have hydro is actually relatively cheap here. And just to give you a note here, the blue represents the capital cost of this. So the initial investment and the red represents fuel operation and maintenance costs. So capital cost is the thing to build the generator originally, let's say. Red is the maintenance and upkeep of it. So again, hydro and wind relatively cheap, not as cheap as natural gas, obviously, here. And then we can see solar photovoltaic down here at about 22 cents. So it's actually a relatively expensive one based on this data from 2011. So we know that it's probably not going to be as widely adopted as it could be if it were cheaper. So the better improvements on efficiency of these things makes the energy cheaper per amount that you need. And just improving production as well could reduce costs and reduce the cost overall of its use as well. So what's a potential solution or a parcel solution to this problem? So we could potentially make thin film organic solar cells with an efficiency of more than 20% integrated into building materials. So you can see a imaginary diagram here where we could introduce this as part of a roof. It's a large flexible piece. And the idea would be we want to improve the efficiency. OK, how can we do this? Well, we could use better solar cells using things like quantum dots to capture the photons. We could use multi-layer cells, or we could have different and tunable band gaps in our solar cells as well. Now, how could we do this at kind of a macro scale? We've looked at if we can improve this one piece of technology, what would happen? But what if we want to do this across the board, obviously? We don't want to solve this problem for an individual. We want to solve it for society. So we could introduce something like the smart grid. So we have an example here. It's a vision for the future, a network of integrated microgrids that can monitor and heal itself. OK, what are the pieces that actually make this? We could have some smart appliances that shut off in response to frequency fluctuations or maybe shut off when not required anymore. Demand management. So use can be shifted to off-peak times to save money. So this is more on the personal side of things, using off-peak operation for whatever process you're attempting, if possible. And then on the more electronic side of things, we could introduce processors, for example, that execute special protection schemes in microseconds. So let's say we look on the right here and there's some disturbance in the grid. Something bad has happened to this part of the grid. Well, we have a sensor that detects these fluctuations and disturbances and can signal for areas to be isolated. So suddenly, this part of the grid 
is just taken out of the main grid, isolated until the problem can be rectified and solved. Next, we've talked somewhat about storage here for energy. So we need to actually store this energy for off-peak usage if, let's say, it's nighttime, you've had a series of cloudy days, you still need to be able to have energy available for people to use. So some way to store this energy. And then lastly, having generators, so energy from solid generators and solar panels to reduce overall demand on the grid. So we could introduce these on, if they're on every house, for example, you could draw most of your power from these solar cells. And then when you need extra, you could draw from the grid instead, reducing the overall demand on that system. So let's look at kind of the Department of Electronics viewpoint now. So how can we do better? Well, to do or to improve this system, we would need better materials or devices that more efficiently convert sunlight to electricity. So this would be kind of the engineering physics focus there. Second, we'd need better electronics to extract the energy. So electronics that consume less power themselves are more efficient when converting it. This would be kind of the electrical engineering side. And then last, better systems and integration on the actual power systems and things like that. So that would be the three side. That's kind of smart grid that we talked about there. So overall, we have to lower costs and improve efficiency to actually get wider society to adopt things because making the best technological solution is often great from a technological standpoint, but it doesn't matter if you have the best technological solution if no one actually adopts it and uses it. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Again, I'm Michael Feuerham. If you have any more questions, again, I'll be in my booth following this for the next little while. You can also take a look at this link here, which is the faculty members link for my department. So you can go through each faculty member, look at what areas of research they're looking in, things like that. And these are the programs we offer again, Electrical Engineering 3 and Engineering Physics. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day, everyone. Uh, I believe I have a couple of minutes. If there's any questions in the chat, I'll check those quickly as well. What is the average class size for the Electrical Engineering degree and what percentage of those students actually graduate? So I can't confirm a percentage graduation rate. Um, I, don't, I don't have that number available. Um, and it depends on the class size. So let's look at potentially uh, Electronics 2501 is kind of a second year electronics course, but it's the first true electronics focused course that electrical engineers will take specifically. I would say you're looking at kind of a class of up to 200 to 250 students. Uh, there are multiple sections offered, so that number will vary depending on how many sections there are on a year and how many instructors and things like that. But once you get to fourth year, for example, the microwave um, circuits course has maybe 15 to 20 students. So once you get to those more specialized fourth year courses, you move to smaller and smaller classes typically. As far as what percentage of students actually graduate, as I said, I don't really have an exact number on that. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that um, the Carlton uh, host would know about either. Um, however, it I won't I won't um, give you a false answer here. Engineering in general is a pretty tough degree. Um, you have to be kind of committed to to enjoying it. Um, it's not for everyone, but it is it is a very rewarding degree. That is for sure. Um, yeah. Any follow up questions? Okay. Well, I believe that's everything from my end. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be taking probably a couple minute of break just to grab some water in that, but then I'll be in my booth. If anyone has any follow on questions or wants to discuss anything, feel free to stop by. Have a great day and thank you very much.